Nearly once in a lifetime event, the April 8th solar eclipse will be the last one we can see in the continental U.S. until 2044. Countdown 1, more day until April 8th. Total solar eclipse and darkness covering the United States. What's even more strange is that it is related to the former head of the U.S. government, Donald Trump, and the expected rematch between him and the current U.S. president. Why is this total solar eclipse event worth looking forward to? How do we know if this is a sign of the end times? In this episode, I will explain in more detail. Smash that thumbs up button for me, leave me a comment down below, and share this video with your friends. And let's get started. Number 7 holds a mystique that seems to transcend mere coincidence. The alignment of events surrounding the number 7 is intriguing, to say the least. Consider the phenomenon of total solar eclipses rare celestial occurrences that captivate humanity's imagination. In 2017, amidst the political fervor of an election year, a total solar eclipse swept across the United States, casting its shadow from coast to coast. The symbolism is undeniable, as if nature itself paused to witness the political drama unfolding below. Fast forward to the present, and history appears to be repeating itself in a curious fashion. In 2024, exactly seven years after the 2017 eclipse, the stage is once again set for a pivotal moment in American politics. Donald Trump, a polarizing figure whose rise to power defied conventional wisdom, finds himself at the forefront of yet another electoral contest. As the race to the White House intensifies, Trump emerges as a dominant force, poised to reclaim the pinnacle of power he once held. Number 7 is a special number because it is not difficult to realize that the total solar eclipse event is closely related to the 2017 election. This year also had a total solar eclipse. And exactly seven years later, in 2024, Donald Trump is leading the race to the White House, and he will most likely reach the peak of power in December 2024. One more detail is that in the seven years since 2017, this election is closely related to the seven-year tribulation period of the Gog and Magog War in the United States and the Land of Israel. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon is positioned between the sun and earth and casts a shadow on our planet. During a total solar eclipse, for locations within the path of totality, the 115-mile or 185-kilometer wide route through North America, observers will be able to see the moon cover 100% of the sun's disk. The first place in North America to experience the totality stage of the solar eclipse, whereby the moon covers 100% of the sun's disk, will be Mazatlan in Sinaloa, Mexico, with totality beginning at 11.07 a.m., MST or 1.07 p.m., EDT, and lasting for 4 minutes, 20 seconds. Many people believe this is a normal natural phenomenon, but others believe this is a message from God. Disaster is coming. God is turning back to us as a punishment for our wrongdoing. The Lord said in Amos book, one of the Bible sections related to the horror of the solar eclipse, I will make the sun set at noon, I will darken the earth on a sunny day before the great and terrible day of the Lord, I will place the cakes in the sky and on the earth, blood and fire and smoke columns. Perhaps that prophecy will appear because the eclipse will take place at 1.07 p.m. EDT. That level is also considered noon. Continuing a paragraph from Joel's book. The sun will turn into darkness, and the moon into blood. It's not unexpected that the ancient Israelis saw the eclipse as a negative omen. The darkness of the eclipse day creates a sense of intuition, or at least gloom. In addition to the celestial events like solar eclipses, numerous natural phenomena have been observed to coincide with significant changes or impending calamities. In previous discussions, I've explored the peculiar behavior of animals, particularly deer, which often exhibit unusual reactions during times of imminent danger or environmental disturbances. However, it's not just animals that seem to sense the shifts in the atmosphere. Nature itself often responds in dramatic ways. Consider the plethora of natural disasters that have plagued humanity throughout history, storms of unprecedented magnitude, devastating floods that engulf entire regions, hailstorms that pummel crops, earthquakes that shake the very foundations of the earth, and volcanoes that unleash torrents of molten lava. These events, while occurring independently of solar eclipses, share a common thread of unpredictability and potential for widespread destruction. Furthermore, 
Ancient civilizations, including the Israelites, attributed symbolic meanings to celestial occurrences such as solar eclipses. The belief that a red-hued sun during an eclipse signifies the onset of war, while a darkening of the sun portends famine, reflects a deep-seated human tendency to interpret natural phenomena through a lens of significance and foreboding. Such interpretations, rooted in cultural and religious traditions, serve to underscore the interconnectedness of cosmic events and human affairs in the collective consciousness. Is it a sign from God? The forthcoming total solar eclipse is thought to be a sign from God. But the eclipse's timing does not appear to be a major issue. Yet, the entire solar eclipse can be observed from anywhere. Every 18 months, somewhere on the planet, there is a total solar eclipse, which occurs when the moon passes between the sun and the earth, blocking one. If we look at the Bible, we must be aware of the great number of sun rays on the opposite side. This will help us better comprehend whether God has given us a sign or warning. There are passages in the Bible that speak of the sun being obscured by darkness, descending upon the land, during the plagues in Egypt. Exodus 10 the 21 23 recounts that God commanded Moses to stretch out his hand toward the sky to spread darkness over Egypt. This darkness was tangible, so Moses raised his hand toward the sky, and darkness covered the entire land of Egypt for three consecutive days. During this time, no one could see anyone else or move about, but all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. As we delve deeper into the parallels between celestial events and biblical narratives, one cannot overlook the striking similarities between solar eclipses and the biblical accounts of darkness enveloping the land during times of divine intervention. There are passages in the Bible that vividly describe the sun being obscured by darkness, casting a shadow over the earth, reminiscent of the eerie phenomenon witnessed during a total solar eclipse. In Exodus 10, 21 to 23, during the plagues of Egypt, God commanded Moses to stretch out his hand toward the sky, causing darkness to spread over the land of Egypt. This darkness was so palpable that it could be felt, shrouding the entire nation for three consecutive days. During this time, no one could see anyone else or move about, yet the Israelites experienced light in their dwellings. This narrative bears a striking resemblance to the effect of a total solar eclipse, where darkness descends upon the land, obscuring the sun's light for a period of time. The symbolism of darkness as a harbinger of divine judgment or intervention is a recurring motif throughout the Bible. It signifies a disruption of the natural order, a moment when the boundaries between the earthly realm and the divine realm blur. Just as the darkness in Egypt signaled God's power and protection over the Israelites, so too do solar eclipses serve as reminders of the awe-inspiring forces at work in the universe. In light of these parallels, the upcoming total solar eclipse, which is set to cast its shadow across the entirety of the United States, takes on added significance. Could it be interpreted as a modern-day manifestation of the biblical prophecies foretelling days of darkness and divine reckoning? While interpretations may vary, the convergence of celestial events and biblical narratives invites us to ponder the mysteries of faith and the intricate relationship between the heavens and the earth. Once again, the ancient texts of the Old Testament offer some of the earliest records of eclipses in human history, dating back approximately 3,224 years ago. According to the book of Joshua 10, 12 and 13, during the time when Joshua was leading the Israelites, he prayed to the Lord on the day of battle against the Amorites. He requested that the sun and moon stand still in the valley of Ijalon, and astonishingly, the sun stood still in the middle of the sky and did not set until the Israelites had avenged themselves on their enemies. This remarkable event, where the sun seemingly paused in its course, bears similarity to an eclipse. Later, during the crucifixion of Jesus as recorded in the New Testament, another extraordinary occurrence is described in Mark 15.33, where darkness covered the land from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. This darkness during the crucifixion is seen by some as fulfilling a prophecy in the Bible regarding the darkening of the sun. Revelation 6.12 also alludes to a future event where the sun will become black as sackcloth and the moon will become like blood. Many interpret this as a prophetic description of a solar eclipse. Additionally, both Matthew 24.29 and Mark 13.24 speak of the sun being darkened immediately after a time of tribulation, further reinforcing the idea of celestial signs heralding significant events. 
In Christian belief, the sun often symbolizes nations around the world, while the moon symbolizes the nation of Israel due to the lunar-based calendar used by the Jewish people. Therefore, when a total solar eclipse occurs, it is perceived as a warning directed at specific countries or regions along its path. Jesus himself spoke of signs in the sun, moon, and stars preceding his return, suggesting that celestial events such as eclipses could serve as indicators of the imminent fulfillment of biblical prophecy. As such, some view eclipses as divine warnings, prompting individuals to repent and prepare for the return of Jesus Christ. In light of these interpretations, believers are urged to heed the signs and turn to God in prayer, seeking His grace and guidance as they await the culmination of history and the fulfillment of divine promises. Amen. Do not be troubled by any of these signs, for if you are a true believer in Jesus, you need not fear what is to come. Though you may endure suffering during your time on earth, it is but a fleeting moment compared to the eternal glory that awaits you in heaven with Jesus. As followers of Christ, we are assured of our ultimate destination and the promise of everlasting life in the presence of our Savior. Therefore, let not the trials and tribulations of this world dismay you, for they are temporary and pale in comparison to the eternal joy that awaits those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. So, stand firm in your belief, trusting in the Lord's unfailing love and His promise of eternal redemption. It is through these transformative experiences that individuals are brought to a pivotal realization, the futility of their idols. Idolatry, as depicted in the Bible, transcends the mere worship of graven images. It encompasses any object or pursuit that usurps the place of God in our hearts. The Apostle Paul, in his epistles, equates this sin with the contemporary vices of greed and covetousness. Our modern-day idols, be they luxurious automobiles, state-of-the-art entertainment systems, or other material possessions, demand our time, energy, and affection, much like the household gods of ancient cultures. Yet, there will come a time when humanity will recognize the emptiness of such desires. The prophetic writings of Isaiah foretell a day shrouded in celestial darkness, a day when the luminaries of heaven, the stars, the sun, and the moon, will withhold their light. This imagery echoes the plagues of Egypt, particularly the preternatural darkness that befell the land during the Exodus. Similarly, Ezekiel's prophecies allude to ominous signs in the heavens, serving as harbingers of a time when the world, long ensnared by the deceiver's influence, will confront a period of spiritual reckoning. The prophet Joel marks the advent of these signs with an evocative declaration. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Joel 2, 31. This day of the Lord, a concept reiterated throughout the scriptures, signifies a momentous epoch designed to upend the established order and pave the way for the Messiah's righteous rule. Haggai's prophecy speaks of a divine shaking of the heavens and the earth, a metaphorical expression of this impending day of transformation. In the midst of this eschatological unfolding, one might ponder the nature of the wrathful lamb. This paradoxical image encapsulates the dual aspects of Christ's character, the Lamb of God, who embodies sacrifice and redemption, and the righteous judge, who will execute divine justice. The day of the Lord, therefore, is not merely a time of wrath, but also a herald of hope, signaling the dawn of a new era under the benevolent reign of Jesus Christ. It is a call to humility, to cast aside our prideful ways and to embrace the wisdom that comes from walking in the light of God's truth. So why will God send the heavenly signs? The celestial signs that God will send serve as a divine herald, announcing the impending return of Christ and the establishment of His kingdom. These signs are a merciful wake-up call from our loving God, intended to illuminate the darkness of this world's sins, pride, idolatry, and greed and to guide humanity towards repentance and salvation. The concept of the wrath of the Lamb, as depicted in Revelation 6.16, presents a profound paradox. The Lamb, typically a symbol of gentleness and innocence, is portrayed as the bearer of divine wrath. This stark imagery underscores the gravity of God's judgment and the seriousness of the call to repentance. The scriptures reveal that God's wrath is not arbitrary, but is a response to the cries of the martyred saints, who, having suffered for their faithfulness, seek justice from the Almighty. Their plea, 
How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Revelation 6.10 reflects the tension between divine patience and the necessity for righteous judgment. God's anger, though fearsome, is rooted in his love and desire for righteousness. It is a controlled and purposeful expression of his character, aimed at eradicating evil and restoring goodness. The world's self-destructive path, marked by twisted reasoning and immoral deeds, is reminiscent of the days of Noah, where wickedness escalated with each passing generation. The Lord's observation of humanity's pervasive evil grieved him deeply, as he lamented the creation that had strayed so far from its intended purpose, Genesis 6 5 6. God's sorrow is not merely a reaction to sin, but a reflection of his compassionate heart, pained by the sight of his children ensnared in self-destruction. Throughout history, there have been pivotal moments when God's grief, coupled with his righteous indignation, has necessitated decisive action. These interventions, though sometimes severe, are expressions of God's boundless love and his commitment to justice. The end times, as foretold in the scriptures, will be a period of unprecedented tribulation, akin to the trials of Noah's era. But they will also usher in a new epoch of peace and righteousness under Christ's reign. In essence, the wrath of the Lamb is not a contradiction of God's nature, but a manifestation of his unwavering dedication to upholding truth and virtue. It serves as a reminder that the Creator's patience has limits and that a day of reckoning will come, fulfilling the prophecies and setting the stage for the ultimate triumph of good over evil. The Almighty, the Creator of all life, and the one who holds the power to resurrect, often employs what is known as tough love to reach the hearts of his creation. This divine approach was evident during the era of Noah, where humanity's wickedness had reached such depths that only a global deluge could clean to the earth, Genesis 6 Fomi 5 Hoin 6. Similarly, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were consumed by fire from heaven due to their grievous sins, serving as a testament to God's intolerance of iniquity. Genesis 19 24 25. In the forthcoming days, it is foretold that God will once again manifest his tough love as a means to purify and prepare the world for the coming of his kingdom. The Lord's aversion to sin is profound because it is antithetical to his very nature. Sin is the root of all evil and suffering that plagues our world. It is the barrier that separates humanity from experiencing the fullness of God's love and the peace he desires for us. The scriptures assure us that in the kingdom of God, where his principles reign supreme, there will be an era of unparalleled peace and joy. A time is coming when every tear will be dried and all grief will be consoled as the devastating consequences of sin are eradicated forever. Revelation 21, 4. The return of Jesus Christ will happen quickly and unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. There is very little we can do about political, military, and environmental events around the world. By the time the signs in heaven begin to appear, it will be too late if we've been spiritually deceived. What we can do now, however, is watch. This command to watch from Jesus is an important one. Keep a close eye on your own beliefs and how they align with what the Bible teaches and you will be watching just as Jesus instructed. We see this emphasis to watch made again, this time in the book of Revelation. Christ speaks of the seven plagues that will come on the earth just prior to his second coming. Revelation 16:15 says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So where are the angels right now, and what are they doing? In Revelation 5, the answer to that question is clear. Right now, the angels are encircling the throne where the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, is seated, and they are crying out with praise, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Where are the angels? They are in heaven. What are they doing? They are worshiping Jesus Christ. They are adoring him. They are submitting to him. He is the epicenter of their affection and their attention. In the grand tapestry of existence, a question arises that challenges our perception of reality. Do the celestial beings we know as angels possess a deeper understanding of the universe than we do? The scriptures provide a profound insight into this inquiry. According to James 4.14, our lives are akin to a fleeting mist, 
visible for a moment before dissipating into the ether. This metaphor serves as a humbling reminder of the transient nature of our earthly sojourn. Despite this, many of us conduct our lives with a myopic focus on the material world, investing our energies and passions into the pursuit of temporal achievements and pleasures. We often elevate our careers, wealth, relationships, and personal gratifications to the highest pedestal, effectively rendering them objects of adoration. Yet, in doing so, we overlook the eternal perspective that the heavenly hosts behold. Angels, those divine messengers and servants of God, perceive the grand narrative of creation with clarity. They have witnessed the unfolding of salvation history, from the incarnation of Jesus Christ to his ultimate sacrifice and triumphant resurrection. Their response to this revelation is one of unceasing worship and adoration. They recognize Christ as the fulcrum of existence, the epitome of love and grace. While the world has experienced events that affect every part of the globe, this will be an event the entire world population will experience together. His second coming will be literal, global, and glorious. A joyous occasion as Jesus comes back for us. And we can know that this signals the end of an age of a sin-riddled world. As described in the book of Titus, this is the blessed hope. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Isaiah 25, 9, ESV. The second coming will be an actual event everyone will experience. No one will be able to miss him coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Revelation 1, 7, ESV. Matthew 24, 27 describes it as similar to how Lighting comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man, CSB. This isn't a metaphorical event to represent a spiritual achievement or awakening, and it isn't a phenomenon that happens secretly or on some different plane of reality. This is Jesus physically doing what he promised he'd do when he ascended back to heaven after his earthly ministry. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next video. Stay tuned for the next video. Stay tuned for the next video.